Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org. Cactus and succulent plants are so popular, and it's easy to understand why. They are easy to grow, there are so many varieties to choose from, and they are so pretty in dish gardens and fairy gardens which have become very popular. I recently found out that one of the largest collections of cactus and succulent plants in the world is in North Dakota of all places. I'm Mary Holm and come along with Prairie Yard and Garden as we go see the Vitco collection. When I think of cactus plants, I think of places with deserts like California or Arizona. In fact, our friend Ted, who lives in Arizona, always sends us pictures when his cacti are in bloom and the flowers are just beautiful. Well, move over Arizona. Prairie Yard and Garden is visiting a huge and beautiful cactus collection in North Dakota near the Canadian border. Today we are visiting with Johannes Alwegi the caretaker of the Vitco Collection. Welcome, Johannes. Hi, thank you. Tell us, what is the Vitco Collection and how did it get that name? Well, the Vitco Collection um, has that name because it was collected by a gentleman named Don Vitco, originally from Minot, North Dakota. And it is a collection of plants comprising about 6,000 units um, and collected by this person, Don Vitco, over about 40 years of his life. By the age of 18, he already had a small cactus collection. And the reason he focused on cacti and succulents was because he could leave them for a couple of weeks and then come back. And they'd be the only ones that would be alive. So he just carried on focusing on those. Um, even once uh, getting rid of his entire collection, buying it back. So it went through many, many phases until um, in 2010 he donated it all to the Peace Garden. What, what were the chances that brought it here? Um, initially, uh, there was a, a conservatory built here for, of about 3,000 square feet, um, not with the intentional intention to get the cactus collection over here, but actually another kind of collection. Um, in time, they found out about Don Bitco's collection and tried to get that up here. So um, he agreed because he was looking for a place to um, safely put his collection into the future. Um, so then in 2010, we started moving up the largest plants. Um, it took some more time after that for us to get funding to increase the space to add another 7,000 square feet on, uh, which was about two years ago we finished the rest of that. How did you end up being the caretaker for this huge collection? A, a little bit of chance, I would say. Um, I'm originally from Namibia in, in southern Africa. Uh, my wife is from Minot, North Dakota, so we moved up to Minot, and I was working at Lowe's Garden Center, which is also where this collection was being held. Um, they found out that I had a background in botany and ecology, and the rest happened from there. The rest was history. <laughs> How many cactus and succulents are actually in this collection? Well, we have about um, 6,000 units. Um, of those, I would estimate about 4,000 are actually unique species and cultivars, which would put us up there in terms of diversity. Um, we, this is not one of the largest indoor collections, but it is one of the most diverse indoor collections in North, North America. Wow. Um, did Mr. Vitko travel to these other countries in order to collect these species? How did he accumulate all of these? 
Most of it was acquired from within the United States. Um, he would focus on buying them from San Diego, mostly succulents from San Diego, and cacti from um, uh, Tucson, Arizona, because it's so hot there. Um, so most of his plants weren't collected from the wild. Uh, you would call that a lot more responsible. Uh, they're either grown from seed or, or bought from other collectors. What is the difference between a cactus and a succulent? Okay, so um, cacti are succulents. A succulent is simply a plant that stores water um, for dry, dry periods. And plants can store water in their leaves, they can store it in their stems, and even in a, an organ called a caudex, which is half stem, half, half root. So cacti are different from other succulents, that they are in a family. They're all related to each other. They're in the family Cactaceae. And all those plants are from North and South America originally. So if they are found anywhere else in the world, they were taken there by people. Uh, whereas other succulents might not belong to any distinct family, familiar group. They can be all sorts, but they've evolved the same capacity to store water. How old are some of these plants? Some of them are absolutely huge. I think the oldest plants we have in here would be approaching about 50 years old. And what kind of soil do you grow the cactus and the succulent plants in? Uh, we actually use a basic soil mix that is high in bark, in, in decomposed bark which is very important, it's got to be aged bark. Um, the bark is kind of acts as an inert uh, particle in the mix, so it, add, it offers drainage, uh, yet not too much organic material. Now, a lot of people from down south, growers from down south, look at our mix and think, whoa, you can't grow cactus in that. But, um, and I would have maybe said the same if I had not seen it with my own eyes. But this is after years of experimenting by Don Vitko. I mean, he, he even used uh, bits of old tire to add drainage to his cacti. But what we've come to now is a little particle, if I can show you here, called lightweight. It's a little clay thing. So it's very porous. It's got a lot of little holes in it to keep water, but also a lot of air. So we mix that into our peat and bark mix and, and perlite, and that offers most of the drainage for cacti. How often do you fertilize, and what kind of fertilizer do you use? Um, we fertilize all through the growing season, which starts in the greenhouse starts in March and ends about end of October. So um, we do a continuous fertilization, about uh, 100 parts per million nitrogen. So whatever that translates to with your fertilizer. I always tell people, uh, buy a store-bought store normal 20-20-20 fertilizer and then dilute it to a third of the strength. And then you should be okay. But you don't really, in the end, want to be above 100 parts per million nitrogen. That brings my next question. How often do you water the cactus? It, it varies greatly depending on the plant. Because um, cacti, as you all know, don't need a lot of water, right. especially in the wild. Mm -hmm. But um, myself, coming from a hot, dry desert country, I had to learn that you have to water a lot more when they're constricted in a small little pot. Because their roots can't really go and look for water. On average, a small clay, nine-inch clay pot, we water about once or twice a week in summer. So a lot more than people would think. And then succulents need more water than non-cactus succulents. And then anything with leaves needs it almost every day in summer. Yeah. But then they go dormant. So then winter, winter is pretty much dry. You know, when you have a regular green, lush plant, when it gets dry, it's hanging there like this. How can you tell when a cactus needs water? When you look at them a lot, you, you see very quickly when something's off. But um, generally, you'll see a wrinkliness, like they'll start to get raisiny. Mm -hmm. And then they'll also produce um, protective pigments, anthocyanins. So they'll, they'll get a reddish uh, tinge to them, which you know, is, is mostly the stress from the sun. But if they're very dry, that'll be ex ex exacerbated. Oh, that's great to know. And what kind of pots do you put yours into, or what do you prefer to put your plants into? If I could, I would put everything in clay, because clay is so porous. It, it allows the plant to breathe. It also allows moisture to escape much faster. Um, cacti, really, they, they, um, they prefer frequent watering, but excellent drainage. So they want to have water, and that water has got to go uh, run away right away and they'll use it and store it. They don't want to sit with moisture. That's the main thing about them. But unfortunately, clay is also very heavy. It's also very expensive. And the larger the plants get, uh, it gets a little harder to put them in clay. So what we do, the majority of the plants in here are in plastic. And they're in a pot and pot system. So when um, a plant gets sick or uh, gets too large, we can just simply take that pot out of the other pot and replace it with another plant. So we don't have 
ugly or dead plants sitting here. And then we can take them up to our, um, to our greenhouse up there and, uh, until they're healthy. How do you handle them to transplant them from one pot to another? I mean, what do you use? Particularly cactus. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, a lot of old strips of carpet. Uh, carpet's your friend <laughs> if you're working with cacti. Um, also, some good deerskin gloves. Um, but mostly you still do get poked a little bit. Okay, yeah. and what do you do if you get poked? I mean, do you have a way to get the hair or the spines out? I have a, a special tweezer with a magnifying glass on it <laughs> that I try to pull it out. If that doesn't work, unfortunately that happens where spines break off inside, mm -hmm. under your skin, uh, you just pretty much have to wait for them to, to fester out. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, it takes a while. <laughs> How do you get the cactus to bloom, or do most of the species bloom? Yes, they, they will all bloom at some point. Um, some plants will just not be happy here, because this is an artificial environment. We're catering to all of them, not to any individual species. Otherwise, we'd have to build little glass boxes for every one of them. So you're going to see some plants are some things amiss. Um, but most plants here do flower. Um, we have flowering season ranging from um, March to end of June for most of the cacti. And then the succulents, the aloes especially, they flower from December to March. So technically, there's always something flowering in here. There's just some pronounced periods. But the best one would be from March to June for the cacti. And um, you were wondering about what makes them flower. Yes. Um, that there are two factors. The one is temperature, and the other one is uh, the, the length of the night. Because plants actually measure darkness, not the length of the day. So the, when the lights st start to change, the length of the nights gets shorter. That will initiate them. But also a large difference between night and daytime temperatures. Now, we heat with propane in here, and we keep it to about uh, 65 degrees Fahrenheit minimum. Now, you know, as well as I do in, in North Dakota when, <laughs> when it's um, January or December and it's negative 30 outside, your greenhouse is just going to be 65 degrees. But then as we go into March and, and later February, the sun gets strong and it'll heat the greenhouse up in the day to 75, 80 degrees. So then you get that large diurnal range and that also initiates a lot of flowering. You had mentioned aloes blooming. Well, I have an aloe plant at home and I've never seen that bloom. Yes, uh, most people have never seen aloe vera flower. It's actually a very pretty flower. And mine in my house has never flowered either. And it is probably down to that lack of temperature range and also lack of en enough light. OK. And you had mentioned that mother-in-law's tongue also will bloom. And that's also not one that yes, I've ever yeah. seen bloom. Uh, again, I guess just not enough light. And that's a plant that survives behind the door <laughs> in the dark. So I think most people would put it wherever they can, as long as it looks like it's living. So. Uh huh. Um, would it be possible to see some of your uh, favorite varieties? Oh, yeah. And even I, when we came in, I saw some that were just huge. And so, could we see some of both of those? Sure, sure. I'd like to show you around. Okay. <laughs> Well, Mary, this is one of my favorite plants. This is aloe dichotoma, or also known as the quiver tree. And this is from my home country of Namibia. It's from a very dry place. It's really hot and dry, like a true desert. Now, there are o over 300 species of aloe in the world. We all know aloe vera as the common one, but um, some of them actually grow into trees. Now, this is one of them. It'll grow into about three times my height of a tree. And instead of having leaves, it has small aloe rosettes on the edges of the, of the branches. Um, it also grows to be quite old, probably at least 50 years in the wild. So it's a, it's a very iconic uh, plant for that area. Well, it looks like it's almost like a palm tree. It's even got like a, a trunk. So yes, I yeah. can see why you use the tree. Yes. Um, we, we also have larger aloes, aloe barberry, that gets to the size of an ash tree. Wow. Yeah. Now, the plant that ne is next to you is very interesting. It looks like it's been blooming, and now it's dropping its blooms. How do you clean that up? Actually, um, cacti and succulents make a lot more mess than people think. Um, but we use a vacuum cleaner most of the time to, to clean up our plants, to get into those tight little spaces. Yeah. Oh, and that's... some very long tweezers for the ones with spines. Do you ever have any disease or insect problems with your cactus plants and your succulent plants? Yeah, um, I, I would say all plants uh, would have, have problems like that. As, as soon as it's alive, something's going to um, be a pest on it. Cacti in general don't have as many pests as you would have with leafy plants, but um, usually we have 
um, scale, mealybug, um, thrips, aphids, you know, the common ones, whitefly. About a year ago, we transitioned away from chemical uh, control into biological control. So for the last year, we've been using bugs to destroy the other bugs, the bad bugs. And it's still a process. It's a lot more work. It's a lot more expensive. But it's good to know that we're doing it the natural way. So we, we have to monitor every week, take a count on, on yellow sticky traps and see what the populations are. And then we call this company and they give us the right predators. Do you have any trouble, um, especially with overwatering or anything in some of the plants having root rot? It can happen. Uh, overwatering usually happens uh, in fall or spring when the plants are transitioning from growing to being dormant. Um, and there you have to have a good eye to see, okay, this plant, it doesn't really want any water. It's been sitting wet for the last week. I gotta stop watering it. And that you just have to get used to, get an eye to it. Because yeah, I've killed some plants and that's how you learn. <laughs> okay, well I was noticing that there's a plant here that looks like it's somewhat dormant. Uh -huh. And so I was wondering, is that a problem or is this a natural phenomenon that the plant's going through? Um, that looks like a problem that is developing, but this, is, this plant is also dormant. It's from the Mediterranean rainfall re um, region of southern Africa, the Cape. Uh, it's a very small, small floristic kingdom, but it's also the most diverse flor floristic kingdom in the world. Um, so hot, dry summers, just like California, and then cool winter rains. So these plants are exactly the opposite of the rest of them. In wintertime, they need water, in the summertime, not. <laughs> Could you please show us some of your other favorites or some more of the cactus? Sure, absolutely. Okay. We'll walk this way. OK. Johannes, this was the impressive collection that I saw when we came in. Can you tell us about this? Well, right behind me here is a group of cacti called uh, Pilosa cirrus. Now, they're all columnar cactus, which means they grow up, up straight instead of to bald. Um, what makes this collection very special is that we have about 54 of, out of the 56 existing species. And we are not aware of any other place that has this kind of complete collection. Now, this was one of the favorite groups of the collector, Don Vitko. Um, not a lot of people collect columnar cacti because they get so tall and they fall over and break and you don't have room in their house. So um, it's a very special little cornerstone of our collection. That's what, that was exactly a question that I was going to ask is how do you keep them from tipping over? Uh, usually we try to stake them up with fence posts um, so that they go deep enough in, into the ground to offer them anchoring. Um, because they're all in pots, they don't have a lot of room to anchor with their roots but you will have them falling over and breaking quite often. And sometimes that's the only thing to do is to cut them down as well. So we'll cut them above uh, about two feet off the ground um, and then they'll coppice like a tree. So they'll produce three or four new arms. And then um, you can select one arm to replace it. And they'll grow back into a columnar again, but you have to do it close to the ground, otherwise it'll be too weak and it'll fall over again. Okay, why do you just go and select one arm instead of letting it come up and be... Pretty, pretty much just not having enough room. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering about that. Okay, and then when you cut them off, how do you do that? Do you do that at an angle? Yes. Do you do it flat? And why do you do it that way? Uh, we do it at an angle, um, mostly because in, in most greenhouses, there's a lot of condensation in winter, so there's drip. Now, if it's flat, that drip water will collect on that wound and rot it. If it's at an angle, it'll run off. So it's purely for that reason. Oh, okay. And then, um, do you have to worry about the humidity or in the winter time when it is so cold outside? Ha um, hardly. I, I don't have a big humidity problem in this greenhouse because it's such a high ceiling. Uh, usually it's too dry because we use propane heat. So it's actually too dry for some of the leafy species. Sometimes we have to add humidity by spraying them down or using a fogger. And that surprises me because I would think that with heating the inside and the outside being so cold that the, wi the windows would be all frosted over. Yeah. <laughs> wow. No, in a smaller greenhouse, you have a lot of condensation, but not really here. Okay. All right. Which is great. <laughs> well, and that really does surprise me, but it's wonderful that you have this facility. Then do you have fans also that help move the humidity out in the summertime and help maintain a dry area? No, we, we pretty much go on what's outside. Our cooling's all passive, so we just open louvers, and it's like opening a window and a door, and air just flows through. So, and we haven't had a reason to really change that. It's, it's worked out pretty well. Okay. 
that means maintains yeah. fine. The biggest control ends up being the water that you add to the soil. How in the world did you move all of these cacti from Minot, which is probably about 100 miles away, mm -hmm. how did you move them here? Very carefully. <laughs> we, uh, we had to actually custom build um, cradles for the largest ones. And my father-in-law is actually a builder, so he um, built like inverted ladders for all the tallest ones, built to their height and their width, and then we would lay the plant into the cradle, and one person would carry the pot, and two other people would carry the cradle like a casket, almost. And we ended up bringing about eight up here at a time. So it was kind of slow going at first, especially with the large ones. Wow. And we only broke one. Really? <laughs> and then how did the, the cradle, I mean, did you just have straps every so often, or did you have it continuously to... to... Continuously oh, and dispersed, but also covered in carpet. So then the, that keeps spines from breaking off. And that's a, that's a major part of what's beautiful about them is their spines. So we don't want to break those off. What, what distinguishes one kind from another as far as like their, their color and their, their spines? Tell us about that. Yeah, a, a lot of things, how many ribs they have, their spines, their flowers. Sometimes it's very hard to tell until they flower actually. And you see, oh, this one's got an orange and it's got a yellow flower. And that's the only difference between them. But what makes this group, the pilosis here, is so unique is um, two things. You'll see this kind of fuzz here that they produce. It's not something that you can make into yarn, but uh, people do use it for, to stuff their um, pillows for insulation. Now, their natural range is from uh, between central Mexico and central Brazil, so completely out of any frost range. And um, they're all also bat pollinated. So they'll only flower at night, and if that flower doesn't get pollinated that night, it blackens and falls off the next morning. Um, our bats, unfortunately, won't pollinate these because they're not evolved to do so. They're not interested in nectar. They're interested in, in insects. So sometimes we hand pollinate and get, get a few fruit just to show visitors. <laughs> Very much so. Now, when you said ribs, what do you mean by ribs? A rib is the, the part in between here. So this is a rib, rib, and rib. I see. And that can change, actually. So a lot of people would uh, classify them on how many ribs they have. But cacti can act like uh, accordions. So those ribs allow them to con contract and expand as they get more or less water without bursting. Oh, well, that is fascinating. I saw some uh, cactus plants when we came in that were really blue. Could I take a look at those? Sure, I've got some right over here. Okay. All right, Mary, what we have here is Browningia viridis, previously known as Azurio cirrus. It alludes to its blue color. Um, you'll see a lot of um, succulents and cacti with a blue color. Now that actually has a function. It's a white powder on the outside of a green plant. These plants are also green, they're not blue really. And that white powder acts as a sunscreen. It reflects sunlight away from the plant, and it's just another way for it to conserve water by not overheating. So the older growth does not have that blue color. Yes. Once it loses it, it's gone. So it only, it's only produced with new growth. And you can actually take it off with your finger. The oils on your skin will take it off. It's a hydrophobic substance. So rain won't wash it off, but anything oily will. So if you do have a plant like this at your home, don't touch it too much. <laughs> and you'll see that it leaves marks as well. OK. Does the plant form that powder itself? Yes. And how does it do that? I don't know. It's just part of what it produces. As it produces its outside skin, it produces that powder as well. Do you have any cacti or uh, succulent plants that are native to North Dakota and Minnesota? Yes, we have uh, two species of cacti, Opuntia fragilis and Escobaria vivipara, that are um, native to North Dakota and Minnesota, and also Manitoba, north of the border. OK. Would it be possible to see those? Sure, we have a planting outside. Great. I have a question. I really like the look of mums. Are there any new varieties, something different we can try? Yes, there are. Mixed in here with our daylily collection is our mum collection. And uh, there's a whole series that have, has just come out recently in the past 10 years or so, the Mammoth series, developed by the University of Minnesota. So these are very hardy in this climate. They come back reliably every 
every spring and get really nice and thick and are full of flowers like this. It's a very nice series of chrysanthemums for Minnesota. And one of the nice things about this series of mums developed by the U, the Mammoth series, is, is that they're self-branching, so they don't need pinching. They get covered in flowers in, in, at this time of the year in the fall, and they're very dense and compact, sometimes referred to as cushion mums. And also these mums are very hardy in the Minnesota climate. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Johannes, this is an absolutely beautiful courtyard, and I see that you have the natives planted out here, the natives that you had uh, mentioned. Yeah, we've got um, both the fragile prickly pear and the pincushion cactus, which are the two native species to North Dakota and Minnesota. Um, this is part of a, a larger initiative to create an outdoor succulent garden, um, hardy succulents and cacti that people can grow in our climate to show them as an example what they can do at their home. And also um, we try to use offcuts from our, um, from our production inside which we, which we would usually throw away to create succulent containers out here and also again show people what the possibilities are. I noticed that, that you have some absolutely beautiful succulent gardens out here. And then I see that you even um, have some uh, hen and chicks planted over uh, in the rock formation over there. Yes. And they're blooming right now too. Do they have any problems after they're done blooming sometimes? Um, hens and chicks, like many other plants, bloom from the growing center. So um, once that happens, that specific rosette will die. But luckily, hens and chicks produce offspring, the chicks, to carry on then. And then you'll often see um, the center of a cluster dying out. But that's totally natural. Oh, it is. Yes. I think sometimes people worry that they're doing something yeah. wrong, so it's good <laughs> to know that that's a natural yeah. phenomenon. Johannes, when can people come and visit this collection? Well, our conservatory is open year-round. We do have uh, different winter hours, shorter hours, but in the summer right now, it's from 10 to 7 in the evening, um, seven days a week. Okay, and then, but it is open in the winter time too? Yes, it's always summer in there. So if you get bored of winter in North Dakota, come see us in winter in here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much for sh sharing this beautiful collection with us and letting us come to visit. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming as well. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering a CIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org.